the final presentation of today's conference is by Sri Rajar Shinandi practices particularly tantra sadhana he has written a book on the fundamental concepts of sadhanas uh for two days we had some wonderful presentations and there's much i learned listening to extremely talented people some of them my friends but i did not know that they were so talented until i sat there in the audience and actually listened to them it's one thing to know somebody casually over facebook and then you know listening so uh what i am going to talk about is slightly different from the tone and tenor of the kind of uh uh you know materials we have seen which is uh, very briefly if without going too much into the complexities of doctrines and all that so there are two fundamentally understood paths of upasana within the larger hindu dharma one is the vedika path vedik is not only doesn't mean uh, so today if somebody says that he follows the vedika path it does not necessarily mean that he has a full in depth knowledge of the veda samhita and he can do anything so it 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 derives from there into the puranas the itihasas and and the traditions that follow from there parallel to this is what we know as the tantrika path okay. and we do have ancient commentators actually bifurcating both these two and saying that both are valid this is a this is vedika dharma this is tantrika dharma so uh, my topic today is slightly uh, not only is it on the uh, tantras but specifically on a specific strain of the tantras uh, before i go into that i'll just give you a brief uh, idea of why the tantras are considered as a varied scripture because it is important to know that it's not enough to have ki okay there is some text so tomorrow somebody comes up and says that okay i found a text and i've written something like that does that become a shastra no there are certain basic criteria for that so if you ask so if you ask uh, 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 you know a uh, simple one line answer to why is the tantra a valid shastra because lord shiva says so simple one line answer to this there are many other complexities and all this but basically what happens and this is a theme we find both in the uh, you know in the uh, shaiva shaiva systems of kashmir uh, along with uh, the development parallel development of tantra that happened somewhere in 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 the eastern region in and around the uh, peters of kamakhya and other places uh, so both places the authorization why does a shastra become authoritative why is it to be followed why is it what makes it capable of giving siddhi siddhi means not necessarily a, you know a magical ability to fly in the air and all that stuff siddhi means accomplishment of the principle a transformation that is happening because the source is shiva so shiva says in the tantras and this is we find it repeated from there right up to you know even recent texts like the mahanirvan tantra which is about 2 300 years uh, is the last manuscript we have says that so uh, every yuga has certain properties certain gunas certain capabilities it says the dharma of the satya yuga was a certain uh, nature and the people in general were capable of following that why that's because they had a longer life span their basic corruption level was very low and that is i'm saying at a very normal level it's not that you'd have to put in an effort to be very pure or anything and that keeps degrading after uh, each yuga to the extent that it comes to the kali yuga in the kali yuga your life span is less your corrupt in general the corruption level is high it doesn't matter whether you are a saint or whether you are a sinner you are still born into the same pool the basic arrangement is like this so in that case in that sequence of in the, in that kind of an atmosphere shiva says that it is in this yuga that the tantras will slowly start gain prominence and it is through the tantra and the agama that you will be able to have interaction with the deities so tantra shastras Uh, if you take a purana the puranas um, uh, you know the structure of the purana would as uh, one of the speakers was i think nitin was mentioning so first you'll have you know mention of uh, the process of creation what was there then there is the uh, the vamsas of the kings and the great avatars this that and then you get so the basic structure is what you have a date say shiva mahapurana you are going into or vishnu purana uh, 
brilliant texts if you want to study anyway. So it creates that sense of awe and reverence towards a great power. You understand the leelas of that power, uh, that great being, that, uh, that deity. And then slowly your mind gets aligned to it and then there are uh, principles of dharma, principles of how you should conduct your life integrated within that text. The tantra shastras do not follow this kind of a pattern. If you take up any of the tantras, the first chapter of a tantra would most likely be a chapter on the necessity of a guru. What is the lakshana of a guru? What is the lakshana of a disciple? When can you leave a guru? Uh, how should a guru behave with a disciple? This, that, etc. Next chapter you will have is the necessity of a diksha. So tantra is entirely a diksha process. It starts this way. If you, without the uh, initiation diksha, then there are categories of diksha and tantra. You don't get in, entry into this. So here is some, uh, not to deviate too much from the main topic, here is some parallels as well as some uh, differences. So in the Vedic system also you do have a diksha by the way. The moment you have an upanayanam, that is actually exactly what a diksha is. So original system was that all the three varnas will have the upanayanam. You have the adhikara to do Veda part, Veda karma kanda. Only the Brahmins have the adhikara to teach the Vedas to the others, right? So Tantra takes this but changes it slightly. It says that anybody has the right to do Kaula Karma. Kaula Karma is Tantra. Provided you have an initiation into it and once you have the initiation, then somebody who may be of a higher Varna but who does not have the initiation does not have the Adhikara for it. And therefore in Tantric Mandalis very often we have examples of Gurus who are from uh, maybe, you know, Kshatriya Varna or Vaishya Varna or other Varnas, etc. And they will have disciples who are from the uh, first Varna, Brahmins, etc. So this is a perfectly valid system. This is what uh, Shiva designs it this way, tells it this way. And then there are gradations of Dikshas, etc. So, and in this same context, the primary manner in which Tantra Satna works is, uh, I mean, this is a very vast topic, but uh, the texts of Tantra as I was saying, so second is Diksha, third you will have, it will go directly into the Karmakanda of the Devata. So its main aim, it will give you the mantra of the Devata, whichever deity it may be. Say if you are looking at a text with respect to say Brihad Nila Tantra which deals with Tara Upasana, if you are looking at Kali Tantra, if you are looking at Kamakya Tantra, straight away it will go, okay now here is the deity. How do I approach the deity? What is the mantra of the deity? How do I, and it is intense, heavy in Karmakanda. It is exactly parallel to the Vedika Karmakanda. There is not even Vedanta. I am not talking Vedanta here. Vedanta still has a, you know, a sort of a milder version of the toned down Karmakanda. The original Vedika Mimamsa Karmakanda, that type of reflection you will find in Tantra, that intense. When I, uh, if you have an initiation proper into a Tantric uh, Sampradaya, proper one, and these days it's uh, there's a prol proliferation of, uh, you know, uh, Tantra everywhere and I'm not talking about that. So even to sit down to do a Mantra Japa, you have to make a mandala under your asana. You have to, the place where you keep your Achman Patra, you have to make a mandala, you have to do a mantra, etc. All these things are there. Even if mechanically you do, you have to do it. There is a necessity of this ritual as you keep doing it over time and if you are a little reflective about it, eventually you will see that there is a power in that. It is the power of the mantra that purifies the thing. It is the power of the mantra that purifies the asana that you are sitting, that protects the asana. And this is even before you actually go into the deity upasana. Okay, there is nyasa of the deity, dhyana of the deity, is that a lot of things will be there. And it is important to do that. It is not at all uh, something you can skip. It, 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 to give a very uh, simplified example, if you enter into an IT company, uh, when I had the uh, interesting fortune of having to pass through many years of uh, IT work. So, so when I enter at an entry level and I say tomorrow, okay, see, uh, I am I'm fantastic. I, I only report to the CEO. I don't care who's the manager. I don't care who's the manager's manager. Is that possible? Does that work in any company in the world? Same system here. So when you are doing Pradhana Devata, Pradhana Devata is far off. Before that you have to pass through layers, 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 layers. Each of them, any one of them can stop your progress from there. So therefore you have to give first Shuddhi to yourself, Atma Shuddhi, which is the physical body. It's not Atma Shuddhi. Atma to is very far off. If you can find the Atma, then you don't need to listen to this talk anyway. Uh, so, so Atma, uh, so Deha Shuddhi. 
ಪಂಚಭೂತ ಶುದ್ಧಿ ಆಸನ ಶುದ್ಧಿ ದೆನ್ ದಿ ಏರಿಯಾ ವೆರ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ದೆನ್ ವೀಕ್ ಪಾಲರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಭೈರವಾಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಕ್ರಮ ಲೈಕ್ ದಿಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಫೈನಲಿ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಪ್ರಧಾನ ದೇವತೆ ಇಸ್ ಸಿಟಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ಸೈಡ್ ರೈಟ್ ಸಮ್ವೇರ್ ಇನ್ ದೇರ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಸಿ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಕಂಪನಿ ಸೊ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕೇಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಡೀಲಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಶಾಕ್ತ ತಂತ್ರ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಸಮ್ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಭಗವತಿ ಸಪೋಸ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಸಿಟಿಂಗ್ ರೈಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಅವೇರ್ ಆಫ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಬಟ್ ಶಿ ಡಸಂಟ್ ಇಂಟರ್ಫೇರ್ ಇನ್ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ this is the thing to be able to get a response from the pradhan devata is a huge thing you have to be a superlative upasaka superlative even a ramakrishna had to pass through a lot of trouble before kali actually came and started speaking to him and what was the trouble he went to the extent his desperation was so great he goes into the kali temple takes up the sword and he is about to decapacitate himself saying that either you are here or there is no point in living and he was ramakrishna for us we would have died only so <laughs> kali appeared before so no and and uh, dying is also not a bad thing in fact uh, in our uh, in in eastern uh, india and and in places where tantra uh, sadhana has been there existent for many centuries we have stories of great siddhas uh, there is one called uh, who is known as uh, sarvanandana thakur he remembers when at the time of his siddhi of ugratara he attained siddhi of ugratara and the time he remembers seven lifetimes he has been trying for this and he has been failing seven lifetimes he has been failing it's only and that is when the deity gives him the memory ki how long have you been trying what have you been done where have you been born he writes down everything ki where was he in his past life etc etc that is the final moment of the siddhi third at the last characteristics of a tantric text is that it will always mention siddhi every text there is not a text that doesn't mention siddhi why siddhi siddhi basically means so the magical powers and all that is there i am not denying it that will come that is a that's a part of it but siddhi means a complete inner transformation so powerful that it changes the outer environment also and it happens even today till this day if you search for people there are pe- there are people like this they may not be in public or they may not want to display it in public and the really genuine ones actually never want to display first time i ever had any interest in these things was i was in college and i randomly met one gentleman who was a very great tantrapasaka i had no idea at that time so he was sitting in front of me and i was going through a lot of trouble etc he suddenly says uh, he speaks speaks sometimes and then says that uh, just show me a hand uh, just like that he catches my thumb like this okay so just for maybe 5 seconds and then says that uh, smell your thumb and uh, it's the most amazing fragrance i've ever smelled the most amazing i've never come across anything like that and those days i was in full at least an official atheist one of those very obnoxious kind of atheists who is going to go and fight with everybody without any knowledge but it's that's the way it was okay so uh, and i am thinking that some trick is going on okay some either he has hypnotized me kuch to kiya hoga isne how is this possible then i am seeing that he tells me uh, things uh, which even my closest friend is not aware of just like that starts rattling off x y z after some in my that is how my entry into these things happened it was no i don't come from a traditional background or a traditional family or anything after analyzing all possibilities i realized that he, this was neither a trick this was neither something uh, you know hypnotizing me nothing of that sort i became interested ki what is this ye kaise mil sakta hai how how do i get to this how do i understand ye kya hai so then he said you have to do sadhana bina sadhana ke kuch nahi hota hai and he gave me a mantra of a devata which i never heard in my life that time my basic understanding of hinduism was there is shiva there is uh, krishna and uh, being from bengal there is makali bas aur tisra koi hai nahi theek hai so this was a entirely new <laughs> deity which i had never even heard of anyway so this was this is how the so tantric texts speak of siddhi siddhi is very important siddhi is not something to run away from siddhi uh, we are told that you know you should shun siddhi yes uh, lower type of siddhis are to be shunned but main siddhi the primary siddhi is communion with the deity today i am sitting here and speaking to you and you are responding to me you have to reach a stage where your ishta actually speaks to you and communicates this way whether you look at your ishta as a mother your father your friend or your daughter or this or that that is siddhi it is by his or her power that things will happen your job is only to reach to that level to be that persistent that the deity starts responding and then there are degrees of response by the way it's not that simple it's one thing 
it's, it's a vast topic in itself anyway. If I go there, then I'll, <laughs> my presentation will go somewhere else. So with this structure in place, this is mainstream tantra. Now, we have a, a parallel side stream of tantra also. Uh, I don't know if anybody has heard of this name. So there is something called the Sabat Tantras. Has anybody heard, heard the name here? So it's, it's very popular in North. It's very popular, in fact, not only North, from uh, those who are interested in these things, from right from uh, Maharashtra to uh, Bengal and all those areas, there is a parallel stream of Tantra Upasana that is known as Sabar Tantras. The word Sabar actually comes from the reference to, as you might have guessed in the Ramayana, Lord Rama meets Sabri. So from there it comes. It's, it's not a, you know, uh, proper textual derivation and all that, but it's more colloquially there. There are no scriptures of this te tantra, by the way. There are Sabat tantra does not have formal scriptures. It is something that is passed down to Guru Shishya like this. Primary characteristics of the Sabat tantra is that it uses non-Sanskrit mantras. Okay, yes. So this was popularized by nine extremely legendary immortal yogis known as the Navanath, nine Nath yogis. Nath means the term is Lord, basically. So nine of them were there who are sort of lionized to the extent that they have become mythical creatures almost. Okay, What evidences or stories we find are often anecdotal, somewhat contradictory. It's, it's just like, almost like gods. They have attained to that kind of a immortal status. And of these nine Naths, the second of them, who was whose name is very famous, I'm sure you would have heard of him, Gorakshanath. Okay, so he was considered like an incarnation of Shiva. So Gorakshanath, there are texts of Gorakshanath and all that, but that is more aligned to Hatha Yoga and uh, those Paddhatis, etc. So the Tantric tradition of the Sabar Mantras comes from these Nath Yogis. They introduced the idea that let's give something to the people and that was a time, mind you, when the north was already being ravaged by various invasive forces and the structures were already falling. So, okay, so in a way, the Vedic Dharma was more in the south than in the north at that time. Even a place as holy as Kashi Vishwanath, if it can fall, then you can understand what can happen to other places. Okay, Kashi is like the cream of everything. Vishwanath is, he is the lord that can take from, you know, the harmonizes the core Vedic sadhanas right up to the Aughar sadhanas in the cremation ground of Manikarnika. That is Vishwanath. He can sit in the middle and harmonize everything. You can do both without a conflict, only in Kashi, nowhere else. That kind of a place gets damaged by certain forces outside and all that, etc. So in that condition, these Nath Yogis say that we have to give people some kind of a sadhana which is fast acting. What is That is one of the characteristics of the Savar Mantras. It will be fast acting, it will be non-Sanskrit and um, it will have less restrictions than a formal Tantra Sadhana. So formal Tantra Sadhana, you will need you need a mantra, you will have Upadesham and all that is there. But even after that, a Sanskrit mantra takes a hell lot of time before it actually activates properly. And that is the year of the Mantra Shastras. If it activates, then it's fantastic. Then it will take you to places you can't imagine. But before it activates, and there are so many people keep chanting mantras, etc., all that, but doesn't produce, producing result takes time, Sanskrit mantras. That is the nature of the classical languages, by the way. And there are, uh, uh, at one point, I was doing some uh, research with some of my friends who are interested in occult studies of the Western varieties. So there are texts of uh, the ancient, uh, you know, uh, biblical texts which are from in the original Greek and Latin. So they have certain mantric qualities. It is in the language that is there. Sanskrit is irreplaceable because when they say that Sanskrit is the language of the gods, that is one way of looking at it, the way I look at it, it is the language through which you can create gods and bring them here. Okay. That is the brilliance of Sanskrit. And you'll see Rishi is actually doing tapasya for centuries and centuries and Vishwamitra, they say, you know, he was doing the Gayatri for 1000 years, etc. Um, the power of the language is such, the power, is, the power of the language is so, uh, so we, we hear this term that scientific, it's not scientific, scientific is science, current science is very materialistic. It is very rational and logical, but aligned to certain occult realities which is not visible to the ordinary world. That is why Sanskrit has this terrific power, terrific power. Uh, 
even if you have not the ounce, single most ounce of bhakti forget you you know nothing about the date you know nothing about the process if your concentration power is good and in this age it is not possible by the way i'm just saying at a previous age by following the exact process your pronunciation not just pronunciation the mantra shastra and the and the traditions that are there you will still be able to manifest the deity that is the power of sanskrit it will not happen in any other language so we am i audible okay push the site will happen in classical languages because classical languages have a certain tendency of certain you know uh, this, let's not go into that another topic uh, so uh, sabar tantra was this that you can manifest uh, you can have some connection maybe not as great as the sanskrit one but something more immediate there is an immediacy about the process uh, with the deity if you do it in the local language only criteria was that you need bhakti strong bhakti भक्ति किसके ऊपर लाना है द भक्ति वॉज सी डेट इज अर देर आई नो देर इज शिवा आई एम गोइंग टू द शिवा टेम्पल आई एम गोइंग टू द विश्व टेम्पल बट इज इज इन इवन रिस्पॉन्डिंग डज ही नो दैट आई एम देर दैट इज अ बिग क्वेश्चन ओके बट द गुरु इज देर द गुरु इज फिजिकल इफ द गुरु इज नॉट रिस्पॉन्डिंग आई कैन गो टू इज हाउस एंड से बॉस आई आई नीड हेल्प और अगर इफ ई डजेंट हैव द कैपेसिटी आई गो टू सम अदर गुरु द गुरु इज अ फिजिकल रियलिटी इन दिस प्लेन सो नाइंटी नाइन परसेंट ऑफ दिस ऑफ द साबर मंत्र विल गो लाइक दिस मेरी भक्ति गुरु की शक्ति फुरो मंत्र ईश्वरी वाचा दिस इज अ वेरी सिंपल फॉर्मूला दिस टू योर योर यू डोंट हैव द शक्ति तुम्हारा सिर्फ भक्ति है इट इज द गुरुज ऑर्डर दैट विल मेक द मंत्र वर्क एंड इट विल ब्रिंग यू द रिजल्ट एंड डज इट वर्क इट वर्क एक्सेलेंटली द बिगेस्ट एग्जाम्पल ऑफ अ साबर स्त्रोत्र एवरीबडी नोज बट पीपल डोंट अंडरस्टैंड इट दैट इज हनुमान चालीसा हनुमान चालीसा वन मिलियन थिंग्स यू कैन डू बट इट इज एंटायरली साबर एंटायरली साबर इट्स फ्रॉम दैट ट्रेडिशन इट कम्स ओके and in fact the tantra of the nath yogis they used to believe that there are three deities who respond very fast very fast to any human problems if you, uh, very fast means still there will be people who will not succeed i'm saying that all things taken into consideration compared to other deities first is anjaneya hanuman number two is bhairava and number three is certain forms of ma durga so they used to teach people that either of these three blessings you take first and then you go into the upasana of other deities shiva will take a lot of time tripur sundari to chhodi do tumhara jaan nikal jayega wo tak post post hai so like that but these three deities somehow it's like they are closer to the physical plane that was their experience so they would encourage their disciples engage in sadhana of these deities to the extent that you can have a fruitful interaction it is not just enough that i worship hanuman it should be that tomorrow i have a problem i invoke his help and he actually helps and it leaves no doubt it should not be that there is a coincidence and a retrofit ah maine kuch puja kiya tha shayad it is i think it is hanuman only help maybe it could be vishnu also i am not sure no aisa nahi hoga to aisa hoga ki there will be no doubts and in fact it works that way it is not even a uh, i mean the first sabar mantra that i ever learned uh, was from that um, my first guru he gave me a mantra of narasimha the sabar mantra and he said that you will need it at some point in your sadhana this is for your protection atma raksha if you are going to uh, in tantra sadhana you have to sometimes go to spaces which are not normal like you have to enter into the cremation ground for virachara practices etc so you will need to protect yourself only condition he had given at that time is that you will not use it to protect anybody else so that there is i don't take any additional responsibility and then make a fool of myself because protecting protecting yourself is itself a big deal in certain cases so but uh, siddhi of these mantras come very fast there is a process it's not processes basically it has to come from somebody who has already done it you cannot pick it from from a book and you must have intense faith on the guru so this is the sabar <coughs> tantra paddhati this generated primarily from gorakshanath gorakshanath is considered was considered as the uh, you know uh, main nath yogi who introduced sabar Gorakhnath's guru is more interesting. No name. Both of them are interesting. No offense. Uh, both of them. And Gorakhnath, by the way, is uh, the same Peter from which you have Yogi Adityanath. Okay. And uh, just to mention, the Naths are so influential that Gorakhnath's disciple 
was Gahaninath. Gahaninath's disciple was Nivrittinath, and Nivrittinath's younger brother in Maharashtra. Anybody who has any idea of Maharashtra will know the Varkari Sampradaya there, Gyaneshwara. Gyaneshwara was Nivritti's brother. Gyaneshwara also comes from the same Nath Sampradaya. Only thing is that what Gyaneshwara did was, he is like Vishnu himself, so he gave a paddhati and a sadhana which masses can connect. Even if, see, whenever there is Tantra involved, Tantra is always, there is some karma kanda involved in Tantra. Tantra is never entirely Bhakti Marga. Bhakti is there. Bhakti is taken for granted, but you have to apply the process. The process is important. Like I remember once I was, uh, somebody, one Uttara Sadhak was a uh, very, very fantastic gentleman. He's, he works in a company in Delhi, but he's also a terrific caliber Sadhak. So I was, I had some doubts, I asked him. So he was explaining to me, I was, it was in the younger days, he says that if the Vidhan says that Mantra ko ek hajar baat jab karna, one thousand times, you have to do one thousand. One thousand one means your sadhana is gone for a toss, nine ninety nine means your sadhana is gone for a toss. It doesn't matter, mujhe bohat achha lag raha hai, one thousand ho gaya, abhi doh hazar, teen hazar karta, kuch nahi hone wala hai. Zero result. The vidhanam is very important, because it is not humanly thought out ki kuch achha laga diya, achha lag raha hai, aisa nahi. It is, as I think somebody was mentioning, so it is the it comes from mantra drashtas, people who had that ability to see it. You and I don't have it. So we follow, we take it in the, in the word of mouth. That, that is as Nitin was saying, the sh Shastra is important. Shastra is important because, and the Guru is important till the time the Guru is following the broad guidelines of the Shastras. The moment the Guru takes off from the Shastras into some other domain, Tata Vai Vai, you come back here because end of the day, one day or the other, it's like this. You cannot have, I think uh, you were saying, you cannot have infinite um, intuition. You cannot have infant. Nobody has it. Nobody means nobody. And I, you take the most powerful Paramahamsa and go and ask him the most difficult problem in mathematics. I will touch your feet. It's impossible. Everybody has a domain. In that domain, apne gali mein sab share. That is why the universe is created this way. That is why there are so many subjects. If that were possible, then you would not need a university and so many subjects. Sab bait ke sadhana karo, sab pata jal jayega. Nahi hoga. You must have some competence in that area. Sadhana can align your mind towards that. That's yes, it's possible. But if you have zero knowledge, then you will not come to that. So what was I saying? I forgot. Nath Sampradha, yeah. So, yeah, Ganeshwada. Acha. So, anyway, that track is lost now. So, I'll go into a new track. So, let's come back to Matsyandranath. Okay. So, Matsyandranath. So, Matsyandranath was the guru of Gorakshanath. Matsyandranath is a very interesting character because there is. Uh, some anecdotal stories we know, but there is also a lot of conflicting stories which we do not know of. Difference between the eight, the nine Naths, Navanath, uh, and Matsendra, there is one difference. Matsendra was a hardcore traditional Kolo Tantrika. Okay. Whereas Goraksha onwards, they were experts in Hatha Yoga. By the way, the term we see today so often used around Kundalini, etc., etc., it is the Nats who brought this into common parlance. Okay. And by the way, any practice related to Kundalini without a guru is just walking into disaster. You have no idea. If it at all, if it doesn't have again, you are safe. If it activates and you don't have somebody who knows how to handle that, you will, your life will go for a toss and you will have no idea what it is. It's like just jumping from the 10th floor there is no bravado in doing that. Only if you are Superman, then it is the world will tell you, ah, bahut bariya. You jumped from there and you are still intact. So anyway, Matsyandranath, he was a Kolo Tantric. Kolo Tantric, Matsyandranath, um, there are some texts, uh, we believe, which are uh, aligned to, uh, which he composed. Uh, for example, there is one very famous uh, called the Kolo Gyana Nirnaya, which is basically the, determining the correct knowledge of the Kolo Tantra. Okay. Then there is one um, he called the Kamakya Gujya Siddhi, which is the secret Siddhi of Kamakya. And this text is, to the best of my knowledge, perhaps not yet translated or not yet available. It is there in, uh, in it, was, it was observed in 1960s by an Indologist, uh, Professor P.C. Bakchi, in the library of the King of Nepal. And he was not allowed to take the text out at that time. I don't know recently if it has come out or not. Uh, then there is Matsinda Samhita, etc., etc. So from these texts, we find uh, 
Matsendra is the primary character. Till now, what I was saying is only the introduction, by the way. And I know half an hour is going to go right away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Matsendrana, he comes, he is born somewhere in Bangladesh area, Delta area. And he hears the tantras while Shiva and Parvati are discussing them together. And he is inside the belly of a fish. The fish has swallowed him as a child because there is one story that comes in one recension of the Skanda Purana says that Matsendra was born in a very inauspicious nakshatra. His parents were told that if this child stays in the family, then the family is going to go. Everybody will be destroyed. So they threw him into the waters and a huge shark or a fish swallows him and keeps running and enters into some mystical island where Shiva and Parvati and Skanda, by the way, is also there character. They are discussing the tantras. Shiva is explaining tantra shastras to Parvati. Matsendra from the belly of the fish listens to the tantra shastras and he becomes a master of it. He immediately gets here. Here there is a side story to it. Skanda by the way he is absolutely against the Kola shastras. What is Kola? Has anybody here heard the word Kola? Kola is one format of the Tantra Shastra which is extreme, most heterodox. It is like if the Vedic path is this, Kola is this somewhere. So Kola uses things like the Panchamakara and other, Kola, basically there are seven Acharas of the Tantra. First is the Vedachara, it starts from Vedachara by the way. Tantras consider Vedachara as the normal Logika Achara of everybody. Then you have initiation, then you go to Vaishnava Achara, Shaiva Achara, this, that. Then after initiation, Tantric initiation, you go into Dakshina Achara, Tantra Sadhana, where you actually start worshipping Shakti. But in the Dakshinachara method. Dakshinachara method means it's still you do your sadhanas using the normal understanding of, so you know, when you go to a temple, uh, you do a certain sattvic way of in, in doing it. The mantras are same by the way. Mantras are not different in Dakshinachara. Mantras and all that paddhatis are same. Once you attain certain degree of proficiency and the guru decides it, then he gives you the initiation into... And this is where the next stage of Diksha, which is called the Purnabhishek Diksha, where you enter into what is known as Vamachara or Virachara. Vamachara is the actual path of Shakti which is anti-clockwise. Fatak says, Sab Okay. Where you have the five tattvas, the Panchatattva will be used in the puja, but here the Panchatattva changes completely. Here you have the application of meat, fish, alcohol, and even ritualized sexual contact used in puja. But it is... There are a lot of rules in it. It is not that simple. And this is what is normally picked up by people and made a mess out of. But you cannot enter into this until you have passed through the previous stages. Okay. Does it work? It works very well. There is no doubt about it. There are great siddhas to prove that. I mean, it's not even my word. You don't have to take anybody's word for it. There are great siddhas who have attained fantastic levels through the process of Panchamakara, etc. Uh, and then after that you go into the state of and there is one deviation here where there comes technically something called the Virachara. Virachara is where you enter into the cremation ground. But that is not for everybody. That is for if you are worshipping a deity, a form of the mother, Shakti who needs cremation ground. There are certain forms of Kali who cannot be worshipped after a point at home. You have to enter, even if specific tithis are there, you have to go, even the Dhyana Sloka will tell you that she is sitting in the cremation ground. So if you call her into your home, she will make your home into a cremation ground. Whoever wants that, nobody. So you go there on specific tithis. You make the offerings. You do the upasana, you come back. Okay. Uh, this is not required in the path of Sri Vidya. So Lalita Mahatipur Sundari does not enter into the cremation ground. She can, I mean it's her will. But I am saying that her path does not go through the cremation ground. But her path enters into Kola Shastras very quickly. So Kola is all these five tattvas are there. And one who attains, uses this Kola Shastras, it's said that many powerful things happen, etc. all that thing. So in fact, there's a very famous sloka, Ante Shakta Bahi Shaiva Savayam Vishnavamata Nana Rupa Dhara Kola Vicharanti Mahitale. So it basically you're saying that there will be people who are outside, will be like Shaiva outside Vaishnava, but actually they're practicing Kola Shastras. That is the source of the power. Okay. So, and, uh, so anyway, so Matsendra, from there he attains the knowledge of that, and Kumara, by the way, Skandha, the story goes that Skandha is against the Kola Shastras. Skandha takes the Shastras and throws into the ocean. Matsendra retrieves the Shastras from there. Skandha does it twice. Second time, Matsendra is not able to take it out. So Matsendra, it is shown that in the texts, uh, Kola Gana he is born into a Brahminical family and he is following the Brahmin Sadachara. Second time. And he is not able to bring out the Shastras. Then he realizes that he is Shiva. 
because he is Shiva, he is beyond Achara, so he gives up the Brahminical Achara, which means he gives up the Sadachara, and then he gets the power to take the Shastras out. So this story has been interpreted by scholars in two ways. One is that, that there must have been some error in the ritual, that is why Skanda destroyed the Shastras. I find a different interpretation to this. Uh, it's my personal interpretation, which is that Skanda, the, this, this, the trajectory of Skanda worship has changed in India dramatically. Initially, he used to be, Skanda Upasana was extremely tantric with mantras and this and that, and enters, there's a second phase of Skanda Upasana, specifically uh, we see in uh, Tamil Nadu and other places where it's more bhakti oriented. So Skanda transforms from that into what is the, known as the, uh, the protector of the Brahminical Dharma, Brahminical texts, Su Brahmanya. Subramanya, Skanda. Parallel to him, the same role is followed by another deity in the tantric field, who is the Vatuka Bhairava. He is also a Vatuka. Vatuka means a young boy. But he is Bhairava. Bhairava comes in the Vatuka form to protect the tantric scriptures, whereas Skanda protects the Vedika scriptures. That is why Skanda is throwing away the Kola Shastras, because Kola Shastram is considered in some level as Veda Virutta. This is a controversial topic. Again, not going into too much into it, but there was some conflict between the two at some points. Uh, they, the Vedic texts used to sometimes call the Kola Shastras as Veda Virudha, and the Kola Shastras used to hit back and say that the Vedic rituals are snakes without poison, which is basically that there's a lot of tamjam, no result. The, the, this kind of stiff tap used to happen, but there is parallels also between them. So it is not like the Tantras emanated out of thin air. So they saw what was happening in the Bhimangsha, uh, uh, the rituals of the Vedic, core Vedic rituals, and they created parallels out of it. Only they change the context. The date is the same. It is Shiva only who is in the Rudram in the Vedas. It's the same Shiva who is there in the Tantra Shastras also. Okay. So this Matsindranath then finally goes to Kamakya and he attains a Siddhi of a... He attains a knowledge which is known as the Yogini Kola, which is very... Even Kola is rare, Yogini Kola is even more rare, I think. And he attains it from the Yoginis. The yoginis are basically what? They are special ethereal beings. As I was saying, the Pradhana Devada, the CEO of your puja is somewhere sitting down. There are mandalas and circles of various entities, etc., etc. So basic structure is that at the outside there is the Lokpalas, Deekpalas. Then there are the Ashtabhairavas will be there. Then beyond the Bhairavas, the Shetrapala and all that is there. Fine. <coughs> In Sabat Tantra, there is something known as the Vidas, 52 Vidas. Okay, the Vidas are extremely powerful and they are modeled around the basic gods. Like there is Hanuman Vira, there is Narasimha Vira and all that. And you know, Sadhana bhi hota hai, Siddhi bhi hota hai, all that. Beyond the Viras is Yoginis. Yoginis are basically 64 female ethereal entities, much higher than, uh, just lower than the goddess, but much higher than everybody else, who surround the goddess at all times. Okay, And they are very fierce. Some of them you will find, there, there used to be a cult of Yoginis, Yogini temples, circular in nature, open and all that. Uh, some of them are blood drinking yoginis, some of them are revengeful, some of them are in cremation grounds. The names are like that itself and the sadhana paddhatis are also like that. Of these 64, 8 of them are extremely special. Those 8 remain with Bhagavati, that particular form of the goddess. And those 8 are the only yoginis who know where she is at any given point. Baki kisi ko pata nahi hai. So the original krama of this sadhana was that you go step by step, one after the other, Bhairava takes you into the inner circle, then you worship, come to the viras, then you come to the yoginis, the yogini blesses you, yogini blesses you and tells you, okay, now you have the inspiration. At this particular date, this particular tithi, this particular shetram, you go and worship, then you may find the goddess there. And this process is facilitated by the guru at every step. So this was the way in verse. So these yoginis reveal a kola tantra to Matsendra. He gets it from them. And there is another definition of yogini here. Uh, yogini is also a, a, a female practitioner of the Dandra Shastras. Okay. So there are definitions of this. Um, long, strong and powerful classifications, etc. etc. So uh, there is a ritual in uh, Kamakya is still one of the, one of the ancient most Shakti Bita still active. The original were actually four. Fifty-one came in later. Of those four, three of them are lost to us. We don't know where they are right now. One of them was in, I think, Afghanistan area and all those, etc. It's Kamakya is the original of those Shakti Bitas still there and it's a Yoni Bita. It's the Yoni of Bhagavati that uh, has fallen in Kamakya, Shetram. Uh, 
yogini upasana there is a particular ritual that is done very popular even in north india it happens during navratras all that we uh, so uh, uh, during navratras you will have little girls coming in and you feed them and uh, things like that i i don't know if it's there in south also south also there eh? so north it happens so in kamakya we have a specific ritual we do which is that uh, specifically we take a pre puberty girl she sits down on her feet the whole mandal of the goddess is worshiped right from bhairava to the navagrahas to dikpalas brahma vishnu mahesh abc to sab ka puja hoga on the feet of that little girl okay and it is to be imagined at that time that it is the feet of bhagavati itself okay pre puberty girl it has to be now here uh, once i was um, talking with a very very advanced almost a siddha and uh, was it so he was saying that when you do the and this is a very important process in the sadhana itna important hai ki aapko kuch bhi nahi pata ho in kamakya you have to still do do the kumari pujan the behavior of the kumari during the puja whatever she does doesn't matter if the middle she doesn't feel like very bored am i khelne ja raha hu to ho gaya puja khatam that means that you have made a some grave error somewhere you have done okay now why is this happening the principle that is followed is that just by looking at the girl and if your if your intelligence has been awakened by the power of your sadhana and the goddess etc just by a glimpse of the girl you will understand that she can become a vehicle of one of these yoginis who surround one of the mahavidyas so you, just by looking at the girl you can make out okay, this girl is ideal to be worshipped as kali this girl is ideal to be worshipped as tripur sundari this girl this girl is ideal to be worshipped as chinnamasta girl you don't know anything usko kuch nahi karna chup chap baith ke she will enjoy and then she will get gifts and all that she will go and play you as the upasaka has to have that knowledge that level and during the puja it is one of these forces that will inhabit the mind just like you, we have we see dhyana shlokas of deities and all that right we see the vahanas of devatas madurga is sitting on a lion shiva is on this chamunda is on a corpse etc so this vah- this whole pictorial depiction is very very important in sadhana but that tells you how the energy of the deity is manifesting where it is going to go kaha ja raha etc so basically the deity sort of takes possession very subtle possession of that being entity so the belief is that when uh, that little girl is being worshiped in the middle of the worship if everything else has been done correctly one of the yoginis will enter into the mind of the girl and will accept the puja and will bless you or the moment you get the blessing aapka kam whatever the your sankalpa was for which you are doing it will get done etc okay the girl will not be aware of it she has just has to be normal that is the beauty of this whole puja that means and this principle starts from a little girl little girl is the most powerful in the shakti sampradaya because she is representative of absolute para shaktis the top most shaktis will enter into her because she is very pure she is innocent that innocence allows for uh, easy uh, how do i put it the energies of this mahavidyas to enter and descend and play around and it'll be a fraction of a second i remember once one one upasaka i know he went into the kamakya garvagriha and is doing pranam to that and kamakya pranam is not like normal deities you do you do sparsha jal sparsha sparsha pranam until you touch the water and, and that tattva is also beautiful but some other day so he is he bends down to take the water and then there is this little girl with his father and mother who has come into the garvagriha okay? and he uh, comes near that uh, upasaka just like that randomly he that girl chants some mantra in his ear okay kuch nahi just some random and I, what mantra i'll not tell it's common mantra etc so he comes out he tells calls his guru and says that assess over so he said you need nothing else take that as a sanction that from tomorrow you start anushthan of that mantra a little girl inside the garbhagriha of the bhagavati gives girl may have no understanding of it usko dimag mein jo aaya wo kar diya it is she who is controlling everything coming from a little girl inside that canvas space that is like the highest authority is telling you this is the path you have to follow this is where you have to go ye tumhara rasta hai theek okay. hai so this is how it works now from little girl it goes up to elder women also okay so there is a whole krama of how this works and there are many deeper mysteries in this which cannot be spoken of until somebody has initiation so that restriction is important there etc but this knowledge um, so there are basically A, a very brief definition is a, a, a woman who has uh, tantric diksha and who is respectful of shiva sasana 
the rule of Shiva, because this has been set by the rule of Shiva, becomes a yogini. And there are certain upasanas and worship paddhatis that are done for yoginis also. Okay. So this whole thing came from Matsandranath. He learned it from the yoginis there and he wrote down in text. In fact, he, he uh, not only that, he in fact mentions, um, he, there's a term he uses, there are three types of classifications he does of uh, women. Uh, there's a very mysterious term he uses, maya. But this is not the Vedantic Maya. Okay. So in, in the Shakta Dharma, Shakta Dharma is also monistic, but it does not exclude Maya. In fact, Maya, what you call Maya, is the power of Bhagavati. It is she who is here. She who is very much present in this plane. She who has created. This is what the 36 Tattvas of Shaiva Siddhanta of Kashmir will tell you, that Paramashiva is there, and then there is Shakti is there, Chiti Chiti Swatantra Chiti. Swatantra means it is independent absolutely. Nobody in the world is independent. But Chiti is independent. Independent even of Shiva. Swatantra Avastha she is in and from there Chiti for Vishwa Siddhi she manifests the world and the term that is used is Unmilayati which means like a spider brings out webs from its own body. From her body she is bringing the world from the highest Parama Shiva to the Jiva she is creating. Paramashiva has no role. He is the transcendent. He is just outside of the equation. That which is outside, you don't worship it. You can't worship it. You don't even know what it is. Only that which is within the system, only you can worship. Huh. After that, there are other forms of Shiva, by the way. After this role, then there is Sadashiva. In fact, if you, everybody in South, I am sure that you must have seen Lalita Chipur Sundari iconography traditionally. You will see that there are the uh, the asana, the lowest form of the asana, there will be Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwar, Ishwara. Then there is Sadashiva. Then there is Bhagavati who is sitting. Why is this Krama? From an average point of view, I was asked this question that this is like derogatory to the deities. Uh, well, it is the manifestation of the Tattva. What it is saying, and it's important to understand that when she is sitting on Sadashiva, she is sitting on this Sadashiva Tattva. Sadashiva Tattva comes all the gods that we know in this in this manner of looking is born from Parashakti. There is one Paramashiva, by the way. Paramashiva is outside of the equation. He is not playing any role here. That which Ram was saying, Anuttara, uh, that state. Every other Shiva and Parvati that we are worshipping is created from Parashakti. And these are Tattvas he is talking about. Which means that even suppose you are a very great Upasak. You are an Upasak like there has never been one. You are the combined force of all the Saptarishis. Suppose. Even then, in the physical body, you can only attain up to the state of Sadashiva. Mark my word, state of Sadashiva. You will not become Sadashiva. That's the difference. You can attain to the state in this Krama, you can attain to the state of Vishnu. But you will not become Vishnu. You can attain to the state of Shiva, but you will not become Shiva. So this is how the plank is. So Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra is also there and then there is Ishwara, beyond that there is Sadashiva, beyond that there is Bhagavati, Lalita Mahachipur Sundari, she is, she is sitting there, she is Parashakti, etc. Done? Okay. Fine. So, I will just take two minutes to conclude, to wrap this up. Because this is actually such a vast topic that you can keep speaking on it for a long time because every nuance has to be explained there. And um, so this is how Matsindranath becomes extremely potent because without Matsindranath, we would not have had the Kaula Shastras. He, he is so powerful that, so amazing. He's... Um, the difference is that uh, there are great saints who have come. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa is a fantastic Kali Upasak. Perhaps in the last 500 years we have not had a Kali Upasak of his caliber. Uh, there are many other great, um, uh, somebody like Avinav Gupta, he is, if you ask me personally, he is the very incarnation of Swachanda Bhairava. The kind of thing that he has created is amazing, I'm mind blowing. It's like he, there's no one like him. But even he mentions in the Tantra Loka, when he talks about the Kaula rituals and all that, and he is very open to all this. By the way, he had a Kaula guru, uh, Matsandranath, Matsandranath, Avinav Gupta. Okay, and he mentions all this. And he says that in whole of Kali Yuga, the Mahakaula is Matsandra. Difference is that there are saints, there are Paramhamsas, there are Siddhas, there are Mahasiddhas, etc. Matsendra is like a Rishi. He is bringing the knowledge from the Yoginis into this plane. So that later generations can follow it. He is not taking it from a human guru. That is why Matsendra is exemplary. It is actually a sad reflection of our culture that uh, the places where Matsendra lived... Um, in Bengal, if you go and ask who is Matsendra, nobody has an idea today. Okay, <laughs> so... Uh, uh, various uh, 
whatever reasons there it's there matsandra is not remembered to that degree but he uh, was the primary source or sort of the uh, the transformer sort of see how does the vidya as a tradition come into existence there are two things necessary for a tradition to be there one is there has to be somebody who has the mystical ability to attain to that state and number two somebody who has the ability to systematize the knowledge i am a great mystic i live in a forest kya farak pad raha hai duniya ko nobody cares you do whatever you want but how do you systematize it so that later generations can follow whoever has done this today we worship them be it shankar acharya madhava acharya ramana acharya this is what the acharyas have done or if you have to create a matha even in the case of say ramakrishna matha ramakrishna was the mystic unlettered mystic nothing he knew vivekananda comes in he creates organizes the whole thing into some kind of a pattern and until you give a pattern people can't follow matsendra is the guy who is both the mystic and the pattern creator together rolled into one he does both the jobs and till date there are the whole and kolos sampradayas are still existent by the way if people believe that it doesn't exist no uh, kamakya itself follows a kolos sampraday uh, in south also there are kolos sampradayas they may not be that vocal or that uh, you know uh, open about it but it all comes from that paddhatis so how to use how to purify the when you are using in kolos sadhanas you have to use alcohol to offer but we don't call it alcohol we call it karan because it passes through a process of mantric purification only then you can offer it to the deities you do tarpan of the deities you do tarpan of the gurus with it you do tarpan of tarpan of everybody but only if it is transformed through the power of that and i have i'll just conclude this with saying and this works so well i mean people who are not from this who if you have an outside view you will think that okay, this must be some kind of you know excuse to have fun and this and that no i have actually once sat in a ritual and i was uh, it was i was lucky i was allowed to sit there there was a homa being performed um, and i was sitting there and in the middle the individual was performing he says that okay now i have to offer karan to the deity so what does he do it was late in the night there was nothing open says that get some water in front of me and it's not even a public performance or anything kuch nahi main baitha tha i was allowed to sit for 3 hours with the condition that you cannot ask a question kya ho raha nahi ho raha kuch question nahi chup chap dekho so i said okay i'll do that he takes the bowl of water dips his hand in put some mantra and starts smelling of alcohol alcohol is a very typical smell you'll know it you'll never whether you consume or not doesn't matter you'll know it he takes it with some mantras he offers into the fire immediately that whole space starts smelling of chandan the most powerful smell of chandan i have heard in front of my eyes in front of my eyes okay this is happening by the power of a devata it took me 10 years to understand which deity it is because he had asked me you cannot i did that time when i sat in that homa i had no idea who the hell who puja kiska ho raha hai usi wo hi pata nahi mujhe because i was told if you ask you get out okay i said okay i'll not ask i'll just sit i just want to observe but i remember that whole experience and 10 years later i figured out ki who's which is the deity that can do it for you there is a deity you attain the grace of that deity you tumhe aaj hi aaj so when i meet the gentleman once in a while i tell him that aapko kya karna hai ek bar khol lijiye isse pani ko daru kar dijiye <laughs> he keeps laughing so but it is just joking around but uh, the kolo rituals work kolo sadhanas are there and matsendra in that sense is one of the greatest upasakas that we know so i'll conclude it here thank you